Well, how's it going, guys? It is another Wednesday night, July the 8th, one week from my 20th anniversary. So that's something to celebrate. Happy anniversary, Tracy. Um, tonight, we're going to be looking at Colossians chapter 2, 16 through 23. And it's a message that I've entitled, Look Out. And Paul is kind of talking about false teachings that have crept in. But before we get into that, I just want to ask you guys a question. How are you doing? I know that's a simple question, but I really mean that right now. How are you doing? We are almost four months into this crazy, wild, wacky, unprecedented, unreal time of COVID-19 pandemic. How are you doing? This, this time has been trying for all of us. It's been exhausting spiritually, mentally, relationally, socially, so many different ways. I want to take a moment and just pray for all of us before we kick this off, before we get into this. Father, I just thank you for those that take the time to watch this, take the time to listen to this, take the time to be a part of this. God, we're, we're doing Bible study, we're doing preaching and teaching in a manner that we never thought we would have to as an exclusive way. And God, we miss the in-person gatherings, we miss each other, and we miss being together under you. And God, we don't know when that's going to happen again, but we know that you're God and that you're in control. And God, we confess to you that we're exhausted, that we're worn out, that we're tried mentally, physically. We're tired mentally, physically, socially, in so many different ways. But God, we know that you are God and you are in control and that you're working even through the chaos and the craziness and that you know what you're doing here, even when we don't, even when 2020 has been uh, a year that maybe we want to take a mulligan on. We know that you're still God and you're still working and you're still in control. We love you and we ask you to do great things in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, there's an ancient story as you're turning over to Colossians 2, 16 through 23. There's an ancient story I wanted to share with you guys that I think relates to what we're going to be talking about here tonight. Um, there was a dog and he had this bone and, and he was really excited about his bone and he played with it and he ran around with it and carried it with him. He carried it with him out into the woods, playing with it, frolicking with it, loving it. And, and he had a blast with this bone. He was excited about his bone until he got to a pond. And when he got to the pond, he looked down in the pond and he saw another dog. And this dog had what, this, what the original dog thought was a bigger bone. And he kind of got jealous about it. And so he decides he wants that bone. And so he reaches out to take the bone from the other dog and he drops his bone into the water. Because what he had seen was not a real dog at all, as you probably figured out. It was a reflection of himself, a reflection of the bone that he himself had. And in chasing after something else, and chasing after something that was more appealing, that maybe looked bigger and better, he lost what he already had. And spiritually, that's what a lot of people do. They, they chase after other things. They chase after flashier, more appealing things, and they lose what they have while chasing after that. And here, Paul, in this passage... <clears throat> is warning the Colossians to not do that, to look out, to be aware of false teachings, to be aware of things that are creeping in against the real truth of the gospel. And the first thing that he does is he calls out legalism. Verses 16 and 17 say this, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you in regard to food and drink or in the matter of a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of what was to come. The substance is Christ. All these things are going back to the Old Testament. And, and these were things that were put there in place that Moses, Moses taught specific stipulations about. Um, the Sabbath day, the new moon celebrations, eating and drinking, uh, religious festivals and rituals. All of these things were things that set the Israelites apart. Were things that uh, if you weren't doing that, you weren't part of the set apart, called out, in crowd type people. And in Paul's day, these false teachers were advocating going back to this, going back to these Jewish observances, these rituals as essential, as something that enhances spirituality by returning to these Old Testament laws, by returning to these Old Testament diets and days and things like that, they could enhance their spirituality. And Paul's saying those things were a shadow of things to come. They were Old Testament things that, that, that brought devotion to God, but they were not what was meant to be the ultimate devotion to God. They were pointing to, they were shadows of what was ahead, what was fulfilled in Christ. We're no longer under the Mosaic covenant. We're no, uh, no longer under the Mosaic laws as it relates to observance of festivals and stuff like that. These things were not meant to be permanent. They were meant to express devotion until the reality was found in Christ. He never intended them to be the long-term solution. The equivalent to, of today is legalism, where people add on to the gospel, add on to these things by little man-made rituals, little man-made rules, or maybe even going back to Old Testament days or the way things used to be. And Paul's insisting here that we aren't judged by that and we're not to judge others by those types of things. Uh, these man-made codes, these traditions on behavior and morality and stuff, they sound good, they sound important, but they, they tie heavy burdens on us and they aren't part of the true gospel. They add to it. And so Paul is insisting that these, this is not, this was a shadow of things in the past. The substance is fulfilled in Christ. Paul gives the same idea in 1 Corinthians 8.8. 8. 
Uh, Jesus gives the same idea in Mark 7 Mark, uh, and Matthew 15 on foods and, and stuff like that. And Peter, in a dramatic encounter in the book of Acts, is told that what God has made clean, don't you declare unclean. So all of these things have to do with legalism. They have to do with judgmentalism. And these are joyless, surface-level commitments at best. And so Paul's saying, be aware of legalism. The second thing he's saying, be aware of, is mysticism. Let no one condemn you by delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. He doesn't hold on to the head from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by ligaments and tendons, grows with growth from God. It's a warning against false teachings of, of mysticism. These elaborate self-denying processes, these extended fasting, these extra long prayer times that they would somehow get more access, better access to participate in worship through these types of things. And what these things did instead was lead to, un, uh, lead to inflated egos, lead to unspiritual minds, undermining security of other people saying, well, I'm better than you because I'm doing this practice, this practice. And they're adding all these things, this mysticism. Our status in Christ is not earned. It's granted to us by Christ. It's not earned by anything that we do. And in so doing and so adding these worship of angels and all of these other things that he talks about here, they're becoming disconnected from the head. They're becoming disconnected from Christ himself. They're becoming disconnected as the body from Christ and from what he teaches and what he advocates and what he says is true. We can't claim to follow Christ and be disconnected from the, from the head. We can't claim to follow Christ and not follow the leader, not be connected to the leader, not be provided and nourished by the head, Christ. The church takes its life from Christ as the head. And these people that Paul's talking about have lost sight of Christ as the head. In the big picture, they, they are in the details, they've lost sight of the big picture. They've lost sight of Christ as the big picture in all these little practices, these details of personal practices that they're advocating and so forth. They think that religious activity can displace the God that we're meant to serve. And that's absurd. We can't become so fixated by these little details that we completely lose sight of the big picture. So he's saying beware of mysticism. And then the final thing that he talks about in this passage that the, in the rest of Colossians chapter 2, and verses 20 through 23, is that if we belong to Christ, we no longer belong to the world. Here's the last four verses. If you died with Christ to the elements of this world, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. All these regulations refer to what is destined to perish by being used up. They are human commands and doctrines. Although they have a reputation for wisdom by promoting self-made religion, false humility, and severe treatment of the body, they are not of any value in curbing self-indulgence. So this has to do with, with, with specific taboos that this false teacher that Paul's calling out insists that they obey. Human laws over God's extreme forms of legalism again. Too many people believe that God is this cosmic cop waiting to tase us for when we do bad things. And we lose sight of who he is and how much he truly loves us and how much he wants from us. Because we're trying to cancel out the bad in our life by good. And we're not doing it for the right reasons. We're not doing morality. We're not doing the things that God calls us out or calls us to do for the right reasons. And, and we're trying to keep him on our side by matching things up, good, canceling out the bad, and so forth. We hope to be okay based on our, our good behavior, based on our rule following, based on those types of things, earning enough spiritual credits to get us into heaven. And the gospel frees us from that. It frees us from that mindset. It binds us safe and secure in Christ. Rule following out of fear shows a lack of trust, shows a lack of believing in Christ and, and believing that Christ is the fullness of God and that he is sufficient and that he's enough. This self-made religion appears spiritual, but it promotes confidence in self. It promotes humanity over God. We can't think that we can control sin by being obsessively religious without Christ as the head, without Christ as who we're connected to. We can't think that this man-made religion is more useful than the real gospel. Religion is useless without exclusive dependence on Christ, without exclusive dependence on his accomplishments, not our own. In a sense, Paul is saying in this passage, beware of self-appointed judges, beware of self-appointed umpires. Legalism and all of these other ideas are incompatible with the grace that Christ brings. Their, their worldliness, ultimately, they're concealed beneath the guise of religious activity, but their worldliness, and they're useless in changing lives, and they're useless in changing communities. Trying to get to God by our own means, trying to get to God on our own terms, trying to get to God by our own might never achieves what it promises. The answer to legalism, the answer to mysticism, the answer to asceticism, and anything else is going right back to where we began. Going back to the foot of the cross, drinking long and deep from the fountain of life offered in Christ. 
giving in to restrictions, giving in to prohibitions that don't have a biblical basis, that deprives us of freedom in Christ. That deprives us of what he has given us to live a free life for those who follow him. Christ is the cornerstone. He's the head. He's the key. And in surrendering to him, we find life and we find freedom. If we had spent this night together, we would have worshiped together with a song called Cornerstone. And it ties into this idea of Christ as the head, as the cornerstone, as the building block of all of, of life, all of our faith. We would have ended with the song called Let It Be Jesus. It's about him. It's not about rules. It's not about uh, worshiping angels and adding mysticism and adding legalism and all these things on top of Christ. It's about him. Let it be Jesus. We would have prayed tonight for the Kazakhs in China, and we would have prayed for my friend Nathan Chang, uh, who's a church planner in Kansas City. If you see my shirts in Kansas City, we met him a few months ago. Our church is trying to connect with him before COVID, and hopefully we'll be able to after that. Um, he's planning a church in the Kansas City area. So let's take a moment, let's pray for those things, and then we'll close this out, all right? God, I pray for the Kazakhs in, in China. I pray that you, would, um, that you would send the gospel to them, that you would send people with the gospel to them. I pray that it would be made known to them, it would be accepted by them, it would be taken in by them, it would change their lives, and you would use them to change others. And God, I pray for Nathan. I pray that as he's trying to trying to plant a church is, is hard enough as it is without pandemic, without COVID, and I know it's got to be that much harder through this time, and I just pray that you would sustain him, that you would give him what he needs financially, resource-wise. I thank you for the the joy of them finding someone to help lead music and finding someone to help come alongside him and, and lead in other ways as well as he shared with me today. I just pray that you would use the work that they're trying to do, that you would use even COVID-19 to help accelerate that work and what you're doing in him. And God, I lift up uh, the family of Joe Reagan. God, we lost such an awesome man this past weekend, a missionary and friend. I thank you for the two times I got to work with him in Ukraine. I thank you for what you're doing in and through him, uh, even after his life. I pray that that work would continue. I pray that the IMB would carry that forward. Father, I love you. I thank you for this time. God, we long for the day we're able to be back together. We're able to be back together. We're able to worship together. We're able to serve together and to do things back together again. And we trust that you will bring that day soon. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I did mention in that prayer, Joe Reagan. Joe is a dear friend, missionary to Ukraine. He spent most of his adult life there. He passed away from cancer this past weekend. So pray for his family. Pray for the work that he started over there, that God will continue that. All right? Love you guys. Thank you so much for being a part. See you soon, hopefully. All right? Bye-bye.